What's going on guys and welcome to today's video. If you don't know me, my name is Curtis. And it's an absolute pleasure to be with you again today, to be back with you, to share a little bit on the new series that we're starting as a church and it is what it means to be the church. And today we're going to open up a little bit about what it means to be the flock of God. And to do that, we're going to be mainly reading from Luke 15 verses 4 to 6. And then from John 10, and we'll pull from other scriptures as we go. So, if you've got your Bibles with you, and I presume that you do, please do follow along as I read. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one he has lost until it is found? And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Luke 15, verses 4 to 6. So this week, when we were evangelising in Newcastle City Centre, we decided to challenge the general public to name just one Bible verse. And lo and behold, for the most part, they just could not do it. But there was one young man who, although he couldn't give me the scripture in its entirety, and although he couldn't give me chapter and verse, he did give me the name of a parable. And the parable that he gave me is the parable of the lost sheep that we've just read. And the parable of the lost sheep is potentially one of the most famous and beautiful illustrations of the reality of every born again Christian's life. So regardless of your race, of your gender, or your geographic location, each of us was lost. We were dead in our sins, we were lost in our trespasses, slaves to sin. We were outside of relationship with God and the reality is we were headed to hell. But the parable of the lost sheep and indeed the Bible in full tells us of God's redemptive plan for mankind. It tells us of a saviour. Of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to seek and to save that which was lost. To seek and to save you and to seek and to save me. The Bible tells us that the Word became flesh to come to rescue us. The Bible tells us that it's God's great pleasure, it's the Father's great pleasure for us to have the kingdom. For him to give us the kingdom. To those of us who are born again who by the grace of God have put their faith in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation, well, we are called the flock of God. And the flock of God, guys, is the church. See, our Lord and Saviour Jesus has called a body, a bride, a flock, a church to and for himself. And what an honour and a privilege that is. And if you just so happen to be watching this video and you're not yet born again, I just want to take the opportunity before we go any further to tell you that today is the day of salvation, to wait no longer. If you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord and Saviour of your life, I wholeheartedly ask you to wholeheartedly call out to him, to confess your sins, to repent, to turn to him, to fall upon his grace and his mercy, to trust him. That what Jesus did at the cross was enough to save you. Call out to God today. Be born again. Become one of the flock. And you shall be with him in eternity. And if you need a hand in doing that, if you want more information on that, please do reach out to us in the comments or by email or however you feel fit. And we'd be blessed and honoured to help you in your walk with God. So although the lost sheep may be the most famous reference to God's chosen people being the flock of God. It isn't the first time that's mentioned. God first compared the Israelites to sheep. And then later this idea was implied and extended to all who are called by his name. But the word also says that humans in general have these sheep-like tendencies. It says that all like sheep have gone astray, each to their own way. So the sheep reference in regards to humans is there. It's there in general. But then it gets a little bit more specific towards God's people as we go into the word. But in this day and age, if you were to go to somebody and call them a sheep, I guarantee they'd probably be offended. 
So for the sake of this sermon and for your entertainment, I've tried out that theory. When I was at work last week, I decided to ask one of my currently unsaved workmates what he would think if I called him a sheep. And his reaction is, Curtis, what are you getting at? Because I'm not a sheep. <laughs> I said, okay, I do appreciate that. But if I was to call you a sheep, what do you think I'd be getting at? And he says, well, I'd probably be thinking that you're implying that I was oblivious, that I was fearful, that I was vulnerable, easily led, just went with a crowd, prone to wonder, had a herd mentality. And actually, I was really impressed with his answer because if we're being honest and we really think about it, a lot of that can be true. A lot of those sheep-like characteristics can most certainly apply to us as humans. And this is exactly why, guys, that sheep need the provision of a shepherd. So after that conversation with my workmate, I quickly turned my eyes to Psalm 23, and I looked to when King David himself wrote about the relationship that he has with God. King David knew God as his shepherd. And because of that, we can see these sheep-like tendencies needs are met. Come with me. Psalm 23 says that the Lord is my shepherd, and because of that, I like nothing. It also says that he guides me to lush pastures. He leads me to refreshing water. It says that he restores my strength while I was weak. He leads me down by the right path of righteousness for the sake of his reputation. And even when I must walk through the darkest valleys, I am not afraid. I do not fear because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. See, David knew that he needed a shepherd. And the shepherd says to David that you are a man after my own heart. And for those of us who are saved by grace, our shepherd is good. Our shepherd is Christ. So Jesus says in John 10 verse 27, My sheep hear and listen to my voice. In the days of the New Testament, it was common for shepherds to walk their flocks along the hillside and meet up with other shepherds in other flocks so that they could graze together. Often, when it got late at night time in the evening, five, six, seven flocks of sheep, so you can imagine how many sheep we're talking about here, would be herded into one big pen. And the shepherds would sit at night at different sides of this pen and they would take turns to go to sleep. And one of the shepherds would just watch the herd and protect it from wolves and lions and bears and anything else that would be there. But we have this image of one big pen with hundreds and hundreds of different flocks of sheep. And when the morning time came round, the shepherds would each stand up at different points of this pen and they would shout. And when the shepherds shouted, the, their sheep's ears, their flock's ears would spring to attention. And then they would walk towards the voice of their shepherd. I guess you know where I'm going with this. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. I am a good shepherd for I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for my sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold and I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Taken from John 10 verses 14 to 16. See, like the sheep from the illustration, we, the flock of Christ, are called out from the masses. We, the church, which literally means the called out ones, are called out of the world, we're called out of the darkness. We are called to be the flock of the good shepherd. And again, it's absolutely regardless of gender, colour, location, situation, because from every tribe and every nation, every tongue, we are called to follow Christ for he is our shepherd and we are his flock. We no longer follow the voice of the world. We no longer follow the voice of Satan. And this gives us a distinct unity together as the church, as brothers and sisters of sheep of the same fold. See, the world does not hear and the world does not recognise the voice of the saviour. They have a different shepherd. But when we look at the parable of the lost sheep, when we look at Psalm 23, when we look at the illustration of this big sheep pen 
and being called out. See, the good shepherd doesn't just give his life for us to save us, to throw us over his shoulder with great joy, to then take us and put us in our own separate pen by ourselves. I mean, let's really think about it. When was the last time you were on a drive and you looked across in a field and you saw a field with just one sheep in it? You don't see it. Sheep are designed to be together. The only reason a sheep would be by itself was if it was indeed lost. See, the good shepherd knows what is good for his flock and he brings us to where we need to be, back amongst our brothers and our sisters, amongst the other sheep in the fold. See, we as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are meant to be together. One flock with one shepherd, but with just many different locations. Christ always has been and always will be our primary over-shepherd. He is our good shepherd. It is him who we follow. It is his voice who we know. But throughout the Bible, we can see that God's people have been given under-shepherds. Now, what that means is God has set people aside to guide, to lead, to feed, and so on, his flock on, on the Lord's behalf. All we have to do is look to Abraham, to Moses, to David, the list continues, and then we get to the New Testament, and indeed today, this day and age, and God has provided us under shepherds, he's given us our pastors, he's given us our elders, he's given us our leaders, but he's also given us each other so that we may be edified and strengthened and encouraged in our faith walk with Christ, bringing glory to his name, and we do that as the local church. And it's the local church, the corporate body of believers, in, if it's in a home, if it's in a chapel, if it's in a shop, wherever it is, that we are brought to right now and blessed to be a part of. And just as we talk about how wonderful it is to be part of the, the local church, the local corporate church together, I think it would be a missed opportunity not to minister to some brothers and some sisters who are in the, the body of Christ, but have a mindset that I've encountered quite a lot. And it often hides behind phrases such as, I don't need to go to church because the church is a people and not a place. I don't need to worship corporately because I do it in my own personal time. I don't need a teacher because the Holy Spirit is my teacher. I do it in my own way. I don't need to go to church. The church is a people, not a place. And to this, I'd just like to lovingly say, in some aspects, you are right. The people of God, the flock of God, are not defined by location or buildings, but by their position in Christ. We do need to know our identity. But it's because of that position in Christ, as submitted sons, as submitted daughters, that we must understand his intention that we would gather together there's no lone wolves in the bible but there is a flock of god one flock and one shepherd see it is him who says never neglect meeting together it is him who gives the get the church gifts to share including yours it is him who feeds through the local church it is him who grows it is him who strengthens his bride it is him who does this through the operation of the church. It is him who calls the church to be salt and light in the communities that we live in. Guys, it is his idea and he's not wrong. And sadly, often those people who don't want to be a part of the flock, who don't want to be a part of the local church, may well have issues when it comes to submission or they may well have issues of service or pride or bearing with other believers in their struggles or Worse, it could be church hurt. It could be bad experiences with bad leaders, false teachers or, or abuse. And I want to say if this is the case with you, brother, sister, I totally understand your reservations. I understand that men and women are fallible. We've seen it in, throughout the scriptures too. Leaders who haven't honoured God with their God-given roles and they've fallen short and people have been hurt. And indeed, where you put your roots down is so, so important. It is right to be prayerful in seeking. 
But today, as you listen to this, I pray that you are fully healed, fully restored, so that you again can trust in people, in, in the flock. That you can trust God's intention and prayerfully come to find a Bible believing, God honouring local family to be a part of. Because it's so important for your walk and it's so important for the local church to be strengthened by you and to strengthen you. God is glorified in our unity. So when we look to the very beginnings of the church, we always go to Acts. And in Acts, we see the very simplistic beginnings of the church. How the church was to function and what it does. And it tells us that the members of the early flock, the members of God's sheepfold, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayers. We see that in Acts 2.42. See, as sheep... As God's chosen flock, we also need to be fed through the word. We need protection from the counsel of our leaders. We need comfort from our brothers and our sisters. We need motivation from our brothers and sisters. Iron sharpening iron. We need direction and discipline. We need discipleship. See, all of these activities are absolutely essential for us as the flock of God, as the people of God, as the body of Christ, to be growing in our walk with Christ. And they should all be found and be occurring in the local church. See, it's essential that we put our roots down together. So if all of what's been said, I just want to bring us back to the focal point. The church, the blood-bought bride of Christ, is important for you as a Christian to be committed to, to serve in, to grow in to love in, to glorify God in with your brothers and your sisters. See, the church, she may well be messy at times, but she's beautiful. And the devil will do all sorts. He will try and attack her identity. But Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. They will not prevail against us. They will not pre prevail against the flock of God. Because he has called us by name. He has saved us, he has set us over his shoulders with great joy and rejoicing and he's brought us back to be in the flock. And as the return of Christ draws ever closer, church, it's not going to get any easier. So what we must do, like sheep, one flock with one shepherd, let us heed the call of our saviour, be devoted to Christ, be devoted to one another in the teachings, in the mission as the flock of God. So with all of that said, what an honour and a privilege it is to serve our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, with you. May you be strengthened and encouraged and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I hope this teaching has been an encouragement to you. Please do reach out to us and let us know. God bless you. <laughs>